Right. Well, welcome from. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. One second. That's all right. Um, welcome from Virginia, all the way across the United States. Um, we were sharing earlier that our, we're on spring break right now and our, um, a lot of our friends are going to exciting places. So we plan to tell them that we went to Oregon. <laughs> so I'm uh, first of all gonna make some apologies ahead of time. I live near an Air Force base and uh, unfortunately it sounds like they're deciding to take off right now. So you may hear some of that, I apologize. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hope that that is gonna work. You're good. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, fabulous, all right, good. Then our technology is working. So as I said before, welcome to our session, Am I Muted? Effective Self-Advocacy and AAC Users. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Heather and myself in, in a minute, but I'll start by telling you that um, a few years ago, we had a, a few things happen, one of them being um, the pandemic that made us as a team really take a look at what our priorities were in treating our students. Um, so we did a deep dive into um, what is really important about um, for our, our students and also to help with better success um, outside of school and, uh, and once they, they leave us. So we're gonna be talking to you about that today. Um, so a little bit about us. We work for New Horizons Regional Education Centers in Virginia. We're a regional public day program um, and we serve the six surrounding school divisions around us. We have an elementary, a middle and a high school campus and we see students um, that span from age five to 22. Among our programs at New Horizons, um, our special education programs include the Center for Autism and an EDID program. Um, and Heather and I have um, over the last 15 years or so been at all three campuses. I am currently exclusively at the elementary school and Heather is at the middle school. Um, and what's important to note is that all of our students use some form of AAC. Um, and when they're referred to us from their school division, it's because they have significant difficulties with both communication and behavior. So our learning objectives today, um, the first one is that we want you to get a handle on what psychosocial competence is. Um, and how that relates to self-determination and self-advocacy. The second one is that we want you to be able to um, discuss and hopefully quickly use, learn to use at least three strategies that can be put into place across the span of the school age population that promotes that self-determination and self-advocacy. And then the third one is we want you to be able to describe the role of social emotional development um, and how we can make changes in that area. Um, and I'm gonna start now, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our case study. Um, one of the things that Heather and I um, really liked about this opportunity is the way you have it structured that you'll get an opportunity to um, work on a case study throughout this session. Um, this is, um, our case study involves a seven-year-old autistic boy with no means of com conventional communication. And he actually entered into the elementary school right after the holidays. So just a few months that he's been with us. And the important thing to note is that he's had no educational experience prior to entering our program other than some home ABA. Um, he also has a history of significant gastrointestinal issues and other medical issues. And this is one of the reasons that his parents didn't want him to come to school, of course, during a pandemic and then outside of that because they were worried. Um, the issue is that he pretty much cries throughout his day in our program and staff have felt frustrated about the lack of progress to diminish this excessive 
crying. And we're gonna have opportunities at the end of each of our sections. Um, we actually have a Canva whiteboard that we've started. Um, and we'll explain more about that later so that you can go in and, and put your ideas in. All right, so why are we talking about this? Um, when we did our deep dive into what we could do, um, what we could do better and what and how we could refocus our priorities, one of the things we found out is that um, levels of self-determination and self-advocacy are actually evidence-based indicators of post-secondary success. Um, so it's important for us to focus on these areas. And prior to that, we kind of felt like um, we didn't really place, we didn't look at um, our practices through the lens of these areas. Um, and then the, the other reason that this is important is on my next slide. And I need to give you a little trigger warning because we'll be discussing um, some things about assault. Um, so these are some statistics, some alarming statistics that we ran across that talk about um, how vulnerable our population might be. And these are specifically um, for people with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities, but um, we can also think about just our AAC users in general and the fact that they are vulnerable to, um, to abuse throughout their life. And the sad fact is we have to consider the fact that a lot of students in our population are unfortunately going to be victims of a crime or abuse. Um, so this was, we felt like the most important reason for us to really focus on self-advocacy and self-determination so that when they leave us, we know that we've done our best in giving them the tools that they need. So why are AAC users more vulnerable? Um, we can all kind of fill in the blanks and, and figure um, why our AAC users might be more vul vulnerable. But I did find um, a blog from a system where that um, kind of pulls it down into a nutshell. Um, these are some areas that we can all think about. There's a power differential. Um, there's often physical isolation, a smaller social network. They have reduced choice and control, which is gonna become really important in a little bit when we talk, uh, talk about that. And then a perceived reduced ability to report, unfortunately. So this is um, what makes our AAC users vulnerable. And then unfortunately, we had to think about what part are we playing in making our AAC users more vulnerable? Um, and two things that come to mind, that came to mind for us when we looked at our practices is that we were really teaching our AAC users to be compliant above all else um, and to um, not speak up, to just do what we said as a staff. And along the lines of that, we found that we were often ignoring or downplaying their opinions. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later too. Um, when we dug deeper into self-determination and self-advocacy, we discovered that we really had the tools already in place um, with a little minor change. Um, communicative competence, and those of you in the field know that that should be our ultimate goal in AAC treatment, that idea that they can say what they wanna say when they wanna say it. And these first four areas, linguistic, social, operational, and strategic um, are areas that we talk about all the time and you hear about them all the time. And we felt confident that we were considering these four areas, but there's actually a fifth area called psychosocial competence that we felt like we had ignored. Um, and when we looked deeper into psychosocial competence, um, we found that it targets exactly what we needed, self-determination and self-advocacy. So these four areas here, confidence, motivation, attitude, and resilience um, make up psychosocial competence. So we set about thinking about our practices, 
how can we improve our practices to make sure that we are addressing these areas and therefore addressing psychosocial competence in a better way. Um, so we came up with five specific areas based on our research um, where we needed to make some tweaks. And if you all look through these, they're not gonna, it's not gonna be new information. These are not gonna be new points for a lot of you, but we made some tweaks within what we were doing to make sure we were looking at these areas through the lens of self-advocacy and self-determination. So we'll be going through um, each one of these. So I'm gonna turn it over to Heather, who is gonna talk about access to robust communication system. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so as Melanie mentioned, we do have a case study that we are going to um, go back to after each section, but weaved throughout, we are also going to share stories um, of things that we have experienced with our students because we feel like that makes it more meaningful. Um, and so um, I will touch on experiences that I've had with students that I serve, um, but we will also go back to our original case study that Melanie mentioned. So, Um, access to a robust communication. What does that look like? Um, so, of course, um, if we're familiar with um, the different aspects of what makes a system robust, you know, multimodal, um, access to vocabulary, which includes um, core, fringe, and pre stored messages, letter access, um, word forms that include grammatical markers, that it's organized systematically, and that it can grow with the user. Um, so the important thing for us is that um, we accept multimodal communication from the get-go. Um, we provide as many different communication um, possibilities as we can for a student and whatever they choose to use, we honor that. Um, the important thing is that it's communication is accessible to them all day, across the day. Um, and what we, what we hope for is that there's fluid movement between the different ways that student chooses to communicate. Um, we spend a lot of time building um, staff understanding um, and accessibility to core vocabulary in our program. Um, and we have implemented different things. Each of our students has an individual communication system. Um, they have a backup system. Um, we have classroom-based systems, which looks like um, a, a poster-sized communication board, as well as a classroom um, pod book. And then our, um, the um, environment at each campus is engineered so that um, if they're on the playground, there's a, a core board available there. If they're exercising in the gym or in the hallway, there's a core board there. So um, we try to make sure that no matter where they are or what's going on, our students have access to that communication. So the other part um, that we really emphasize is the role of literacy, um, which of course is reading, um, and, but it also includes writing. Um, so these are pictures of some of the different ways that um, our students um, have accessed writing. Um, we were fortunate enough to participate in the project core research project out of um, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and so all of our staff um, has, have done the modules and the training, whether that classroom was involved in the research or not. It's, um, it's common across all of our classrooms. Um, so we do a lot of predictable chart writing. We do alternative means for writing. Um, and we really press to our staff and our families that for our students with complex communication needs, they can write, there are no prerequisites. Um, so I will tell you um, the, a couple of stories of students that I serve at the middle school. Um, one of the students is an AAC user. He uses Proloquo to go, and he does use some mouth words as well. Um, and he has pica. 
Um, so classroom staff has to be very careful um, what he has access to. So there can't be rubber bands, there can't be anything laminated, there can't be uh, paper clips in his area um, for safety reasons. So he has a he has a certain area of the classroom that is um, that is safe. Um, and one day he was up pacing back and forth in the classroom, and um, his teacher said what's going on? What do you need? Um, and he went back to his device and he typed out, I want freedom, um, which she interpreted as he wanted to be able to move about the classroom. Um, so they made some adjustments. Um, this is a fantastic teacher. So of course she honored that. Um, and it just goes to show um, we, we weren't really sure that that student was capable of that level of, of comprehension or communicating or writing it out. Um, so that was a fantastic moment. Um, interestingly enough, his sibling, who is in a different classroom, um, who has more mouth words um, instead of a voice output device, he has um, a communication board that he uses to supplement um, and he, one day in that classroom, we were using um, adapted keyboards. And so the letters are Velcro. Um, and that student, as soon as I gave him his, he started moving letters around. He didn't wait for any instruction from me. He started grabbing letters from his peers. Um, and what he spelled out with his keyboard was um, Real Housewives of Atlanta. Um, and I was like, oh, you watch that? And he says, yes. And he said, Mimi. And I, who am not a Real Housewives of Atlanta watcher, assumed that he was talking about his grandmother. So I said, oh, you watch that with your grandmother? And he was like, no. Um, and then classroom staff quickly enlightened me that that is someone who used to be on Real Housewives of Atlanta. Um, but that wasn't something that he had ever shared before. And I would never have guessed that this 12-year-old uh, boy would be interested in that. But clearly he was. Um, so... Let's move on to our case study. Um, so this is, um, we have two different options for you to um, share your thoughts. Um, one is you can share it in, um, in the chat, but we also have a Canva because we would love to hold on to your responses. Um, so I'm going to share the link to our Canva. Yeah, um, it may require you to sign in. Canva is free, so um, you can sign in with um, just your email if it requires you to do that. But um, the first slide um, goes along with this question, which is, and there are post-it notes there. So if you, if you go into Canva and you click on a post-it note, it will allow you to type um, what you'd like to type. Um, and so our first question is, what are your thoughts about a robust communication system for our, our case study student that Melanie mentioned earlier? Link takes us to um, a page that invites us to edit your Canva. Yes. Um, I'm you have, yes. In order for you to funding. answer, give your input, you are invited to edit. So you would, I see. you would, and if, if you cannot, if it, if the font is small down at the bottom, there's a little slide um, where you can enlarge what you see. Um, okay. Just for those that aren't familiar with Canva, that. That's probably important to know. Yes. All right. And so we'll wait just a second and see. <laughs> I see people moving around. So just pick an empty post-it and um, click on it and you can type um, whatever thoughts you have. And if, if you're not comfortable using Canva, you are more than welcome to add it in the, um, in the Zoom chat. I, I'm not able to make it work. It might be just. Okay. That's fine. If, if. Yeah. So. Um, okay. I will type in the chat. 
Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'm seeing a few things going in on the Canva. Um, you know, you choose whichever, if there's something you'd like to share thought wise, you choose which format, whether you want to use Canva or whether you want to use the Google or the, sorry, Zoom. Can you tell where your Google users are? <laughs> um, whichever you're more comfortable with. There you go. Okay. Okay. I see conversation starters. I see it opened his world. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, in the interest of time, keep moving, but we will, um, we wanted to hold on to those messages. Um, so um, we will come back to Canva for our second question um, when we get there. Um, okay. So let's move on to student choices and opinions. <clears throat> okay. So something that we started doing is asking students for their opinions regularly. Um, we would ask them, what do you think? Um, I will tell you that it opens, <laughs> it opens you up to a whole lot of brutal <laughs> comments from students from time to time. Um, and a lot of times in our, um, if we do Google Slides, we'll include this type of slide where um, we provide a visual as a way for them to tell us what they think. So if they don't have that vocabulary in their AAC system, they can come point to it um, and let us know what they think. Um, so I would say that um, a student who um, I work with um, at the high school or the middle school, excuse me, um, we, when I walked into the classroom, um, what I saw was him being aggressive. Um, he was scratching um, at classroom staff. I approached and I said, what's going on? And this student who um, is seventh grade, um, he's tiny, he looks more like a fifth grader, um, but he is does not use any mouth words. He does use um, lamp words for life. So when I asked him what's going on, he immediately went to his device and he used the message bad. Um, and I was like, bad, what's bad? And then he went to his device and used the message to divorce and he gestured to the staff member who was closest to him. Um, so he was letting me know he was not happy with that staff member. Um, so I asked him if he would like to move up um, closer to where I was gonna be working in the classroom. Um, and he said, um, immediately picked up all of his stuff and he moved up yeah. to that space. Um, so he was telling us something and we needed to listen. And so afterwards, um, the behavior specialist and I went in and we had discussion with classroom staff about what was going on in that moment. Um, the second uh, story that I would like to share with you is that um, we had a student who started in January. Um, he's actually an eighth grader. Um, he had been um, in a regular public school classroom, um, had lots of aggressive um, and disruptive behaviors. Um, what that school chose to do was to call mom. Um, when those things happened and mom came and picked him up and what that ended up being is that he was at school for less than an hour each day. Um, so he came to our program um, and it was his first day and he was, um, you know, screaming and yelling and spitting and um, he did he came to us without any he, he does use some mouth words he does um, a lot of um, delayed echolalia and scripting um, so I all of the other students in the classroom were seated and um, but they were watching this very closely um, so I asked them you know how did everybody feel um, and some of the students told me happy, some of the students told me um, mad, um, but one particular student who, who um, does use some mouth words, but he's also a proloquo to go user, um, he used the message jealous. Um, and 
after looking at the situation, um, staff members were focusing their attention on this new student instead of this young man. Um, so I said, are you jealous because Miss Kina, who is his preferred staff, is, is working with that student and he nodded his head yes. Um, so that um, was a very abstract emotion. It was uh, surprising to us that he used it, um, but it also let staff know that they needed to be sure that they were giving him attention in a positive way so that there weren't behaviors on his part in order to get that. Okay, so moving on to student choices. Um, so what we want to be sure that we do is acknowledge and honor those choices. We can't always comply, but we do need to acknowledge what they've said or asked for. Um, and what we have found works in our program is that they have tier one, tier two, and tier three choices. Um, so my uh, story for about one of my students here is that we have a young man who um, uses multimodal communication. He does use some mouth words. He uses a dry erase board to write things out. Um, and he also, um, he was using Proloquo to go, but then the family switched him to LAMP. So now he is a LAMP user. Um, and what this student does is he elopes from the classroom. Um, elopes is what we use to describe a student who um, runs out of the, um, whatever their area is. Um, so staff knows to be on alert and that they um, may need to uh, help that student get back to the area where he's supposed to be. So this young man, um, if he wanted to leave the classroom, he would get down in a football position and just bowl people over on his way toward the door. Um, clearly that was not safe for staff, it wasn't safe for other students, and it ultimately wasn't safe for him. But we weren't sure where he was trying to go. Um, our concern is always that a student is trying to get out of the building, um, which is clearly not safe. So um, we set up a situation where um, we would let him go out of the classroom and to see where he wanted to go. Um, he wanted to visit other classrooms is what it ended up being. So he, there is one particular classroom that has a recliner in it. Um, that was his first choice. He wanted to go sit in the recliner. Um, we also have a, what we call the MPR, which is the multi-purpose room. So it's like a, a small gym and sensory area. Um, we also have a trampoline in the hallway. Um, and our students, because we are a smaller campus, um, they can do laps in the hallway. Um, so we created a visual so that he could let us know where he wanted to go instead of just barging out the door or bowling staff over. Um, and this really decreased that behavior. Um, and it also, we had to work with staff on honoring that he wanted to go somewhere. Okay, moving on. Can I um, ask a question before you... Absolutely. Uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three choices. Yes. Um, can you talk about what that means? Sure. So Briefly. tier one choices would be like the ultimate, what what they, their most preferred thing. So for a lot of our students, that's technology. Um, they want to use the tablet. They want to have go on YouTube or they want to use the computer. Um, Tier two would be something they like, but is not their ultimate. Um, and then tier three would be something that they might not choose first, but it is also something that they like. And a lot of times that's something like kinetic sand or Legos. Um, it just varies by student. So it's like tier one would be um, the most reinforcing for them. And then lower. Thank, you. thank you for that question. Thing. Um, okay, so we also, um, in student choices and opinions, um, talk about um, times when a student or any of us need to tell someone something is wrong. And so we practice using messages. Um, and these are examples of some of the messages that we work with our students on how to um, communicate these things. Um, and we have to keep in mind, and this is something we go back to with staff all the time, is that a lot of times a refusal or a protest is the first way that a student learns to advocate for themselves. Um, for our students who, who know how to use language to communicate that, it's, it's more easily understood by staff, but some of our students use behaviors to communicate that. Um, so 
I will share with you a story about one of my students um, who is, um, I will give a trigger warning because it, it talks about puberty, um, but this young man is going through puberty and as a result, um, he likes to squeeze or press himself against female staff members. Um, and so when we started uh, observing this more frequently, we had a conversation with the parents about whether they were seeing that at home and what their thoughts were about it. Um, and mom shared her concerns that they are seeing that behavior um, and that when they take him out in public, he was approaching strangers um, and attempting to do the same thing. So we came up with a plan. Um, and what we do is if he um, approaches um, a staff member, um, and, and he, um, we can tell by often by his nonverbal language what his intent is. Um, so we will use the message stop or I don't like that. And we say that verbally, but we also model that on his communication system. Um, and we have also seen where he has, um, we have concerns about the female students in the classroom. Um, so we also work with those female students on how they can say, using whatever communication system they have, no, stop that, I don't like it. Um, and um, this young man has strong feelings about that. And when we have um, used those messages with him, he has come back at us with the message hate. Um, so it's, it's a complex situation. Um, that's not a situation where we can honor what he wants to happen, um, but we can help our other students advocate for themselves. Um, and then we continue to work with the family on how um, to work through this issue. Um, so I am going to move on to the next slide, which is goals. Um, this is something else we implemented in the last few years is, um, including self-advocacy within um, the goals that we create in, um, for IEPs. Um, it looks different for each student, depending on what, um, what their needs are, how they communicate and so forth. Um, so most of our students have um, goals in some shape or fashion that address self-advocacy. Um, I am in the interest of time, not going to share my um, last story that goes with that, but I am going to go back to our case study. Um, and the question here is, what are your thoughts for our young man who had not um, attended school before the age of seven? Um, and what your thoughts are about um, student choices and opinions for him? Um, again, you can go back to that same Canva link and page two is where the questions, the second slide is where the questions are for that particular, this particular slide, or again, you can go back to the Google or the, sorry, Zoom. I'm clinging to Google with everything I've got. Um, or you can go back to the Zoom chat and enter your thoughts there. And if there's a, um, if you see some empty um, post-its, um, anywhere. Feel free to add your thoughts there. Um, I don't want anybody to get confused or frustrated about having to navigate. Um, let's see. Okay. So I am... Yeah, wonder how he feels about even going to school, right? As Melanie mentioned, um, he cries all day, which is, you know, it's terrible to think of a child being in distress um, like that. Um, I see a comment here early on, um, early use of the pragmatic branch in pod with the starter. I think it's is excited to get student opinions. Yep, lots of interesting comments come out of that. And yes, brutal, they are brutal. <laughs> Sometimes it's a ding to your self-esteem, but you know, they're, they're being honest and we want to encourage that. Um, and yes, the boring emoji, it does say it all for our students. <laughs> That's one of my favorite, even though it hurts my soul a little bit <laughs> after all the time I create, spend creating activities um, when they say boring, I, I have to appreciate that. 
And there's the question, did he cry all day at home? Your student? Uh, no. He did not. So it's just not. at school. Okay. Yeah, it's just at school. Okay. Um, and give him language or phrases to label possible feelings, sad, something's yes. wrong. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to turn things over to Melanie and she's going to talk about um, that very thing. So turn back over to All Melanie. Right. Excuse us. We're in the same room. We had some technical difficulties. So we're moving my computer around. All right. So the next area that I'm going to talk about is communication partner training um, and what we did. As I said before, um, these terms are nothing new, probably to all of you. Communication partner training is certainly something that we all recognize is important. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the how, other than to say that we certainly have found that the use of a programmed approach, um, such as the ones I've mentioned here, um, are more beneficial to us. Um, they're organized and they keep us on track and um, they help us remember things that, that are easy to forget when we're, we're working with our adults. Um, and you can put in the chat if any of you know of any other programmed approaches or other approaches that you've used, definitely feel free to put those in, in the chat so that we can all benefit for sure. Um, another um, tweak that we made to our communication partner training has to do with the Communication Bill of Rights. And for a long time now, we have educated our communication partners, both families and um, staff, about the importance of this Communication Bill of Rights. Um, but the way we were doing it was at the beginning of the year when we do our initial training, we would tell them about the Communication Bill of Rights. And we even made them all put it up in their classrooms. But what we realized when we thought about it um, is that they were really not diving into the Communication Bill of Rights. And also we were not educating our students about the Communication Bill of Rights. So we started to put this into our group session. So every single week, we have a slide where we isolate one of the rights that they have. Um, this is actually a picture of the slide for this coming week um, where um, we're gonna be talking about the fact that they have a right to ask and know about their schedule in the world. And we ask them, where's your schedule? Um, so that they understand, the students themselves understand that this is their right and that this is important, but staff also understands because we, we still have staff members who will have a schedule, but they won't use the schedule and don't understand the importance of it. So this is one tweak um, that we made that we feel like has been very successful. All right, so what do we teach? I really wanna focus on what do we teach? And the most important thing that we teach is the art and the value of arguing and negotiating. And we actually, put this in our goals. As um, Heather mentioned a little while ago, we actually write goals for this. We let them argue. And this has been a really hard thing for us to get across to staff. I think people tend to have that old fashioned idea that um, if, a, if a child is having a behavior that we want them to just be quiet and do what I say. Um, we don't want to let them argue and talk about it but we have um, stressed to our staff that this is actually very, very important for our students to be able to do this. Even if they have to say something 15 times, we let them do it. Um, and I, wanted, I wanna draw your attention to the photograph here on the right that I absolutely love. Um, as an aside, I do, um, I'm one of the people that tweets out on Twitter <laughs> Um, for our campus. And I have asked teachers to um, look for examples of things that we're trying to do um, communication wise. So they're actually wonderful about capturing moments throughout the day. Um, and as an aside, I've actually found this to be a really good tool for communication partner training because they are looking intentionally for these things. And I can see that they've gotten the information that I'm giving across. But this one in particular, um, this little boy was in our courtyard and he was 
um, going around on a trike. And I don't even know what he was doing that the classroom staff wanted to reenact, but they asked him to reenact whatever it was. And this was his response. Um, and I love the look on his face, the gesture he's giving. And he's actually, I'm not sure if you can see it, but he's pointing to the word not. Um, so he's definitely being a self-advocate for that. Um, and this is also an example. This is a core board that we have out in our courtyard. Um, I've got three on my campus that we put around different places. So, and then something else that we've learned to really stress to our staff, uh, we all hear that behavior is communication and we all kind of know that we even have t-shirts that say that. Um, but another thing that we've learned to tell our staff is that behavior is the earliest form of self-advocacy. So viewing behavior as um, through the lens of self-advocacy puts it in a more positive light and um, reminds them that we need to figure out what's wrong and what they're trying to advocate for themselves about. Um, so this has just been a piece of information that has been really helpful in getting that across to, um, to staff so that they're not just viewing behavior as manipulation or being naughty or whatever, that they're understanding that it's an actual form of self-advocacy. Um, and then the other thing that we teach is the value of hearing your students and that it, this is an effective de-escalation strategy. Um, sitting down and taking time and making sure you're giving them time and obviously making sure their communication system is available or whatever means they need, multiple ways to communicate and hearing them and repeating back what you hear them say even though the answer is often no, that we still want to hear them. Um, so that we're saying, I, I understand, I hear you, you want to go home. And we're modeling on their system as we're saying this too. I understand you want to go home, but we have some other things to do. Let's look at your schedule. So um, just getting this across to our communication partners um, is challenging because like I said, they, they tend to want to shut, shut them down when they're in an active behavior, but we've been able to demonstrate that this actually is a, an effective de-escalation strategy. Um, and then probably our most effective strategy in getting these concepts across to our communication um, partners is that to the best of our ability, we drop everything and insert ourselves into active behaviors. And I have to laugh about the, the picture that I chose. It looks like we're just sitting around with headphones on reading books. We all know we're not doing that. So um, this doesn't happen all the time, obviously. We're very busy. All of us are very busy. But whenever it's possible, we keep an ear out. We have, uh, we carry a walkie on us at my campus too, so we can hear what's going on, we take an opportunity to run, ask, do they have their communication system, get the communication system and be that extra hand because you know it's hard in, a, in an active, difficult behavior, it's really hard to have enough hands. So we're that person and we're modeling what needs to happen. And um, that gives, certainly gives us more credibility, plus we're actually able to help So let's go back to, to the case study um, and going back to the Canva, if you're able to, and go to this page and you're gonna answer um, this question, these questions about our case study. Remember, it's our seven-year-old boy who had no experience with, um, with coming to school before now. And what are the things, um, what are your thoughts about communication partner training? but also what do we need to teach and how do we need to do that with our communication partners? So you can go ahead and put your thoughts there and we will revisit this case study and kind of wrap everything up at the end. Okay, so the next two areas I'm gonna go through quickly because I think we're getting close to time, um, but we do have um, resources in our handouts for you that I'll mention. So we're gonna talk about connection to role models. And this is one of the things 
that in doing our research that we found was important. Um, and I would have to say that this is, this is my weak point. Um, I really wasn't connecting them to role models at all before, but I realize now the importance of doing this. And the other thing that we realize is that this is not only important to students, but also to staff and families so that they can see, um, they can see successful AAC users. And I, um, I had an experience with um, a father at an IEP meeting. His, his son was five and he was just entering our program. And at the IEP meeting, he talked about the fact that um, he was really um, benefiting from the models that he was seeing at the time on television. Um, the program Speechless had come out, The Good Doctor, um, and he was benefiting from these models because he had, and we forget about this, he had this very narrow view of the possibilities for his son. But this opened his eyes to the possibilities that his son could do a lot of things. So he was much more willing to work with me on developing an augmentative communication system. Um, there are lots of avenues that you can go to for role models. We found YouTube videos of first person accounts available. Fortunately, um, our profession is benefiting a great deal from AAC users themselves who are reaching out. Um, another thing that is a benefit in our program is that we have peer models in our classroom. Everyone uses some form of AAC, so we have that readily available, but uh, ensuring partner play um, between peers is really important so that they see their peers doing this. They're not separate students only communicating with adults, for example. And then I want to draw your attention to this documentary, if you're not familiar with it, called This Is Not About Me. Jordan Zimmerman is a young lady who um, has a history of complex communication need and autism. And she um, has been, uh, has become a really outspoken advocate for AAC users and the need for robust communication systems. She actually didn't have a robust communication system until well into high school. And she talks about that. Um, this video is available through Vimeo. Um, and I think it was only like $9.99 to rent. Um, but she also has a number of YouTube videos that I've been able to use. Um, so I definitely would encourage you to check that out. All right. So and, in our, go ahead. I, I just want to make sure you know we go till 15 minutes after the hour. So you've got another 15 minutes. Oh, great. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Much relief. I appreciate that. All right. So um, you can revisit the Canva or put your thoughts in the chat um, that we'll go back to a little bit later. So what do we need to consider for him in order to provide access to those role models um, for anyone, for he or his family or staff? So you can write down some of those ideas that we've talked about. All right, and I'm gonna move on to our last section, um, social emotional language development and the impact that that has on self-advocacy and self-determination. Um, so prior to um, the changes that we made in our program, I would definitely ask my students, how are you feeling? Um, but it was really kind of an afterthought and I got the obligatory happy, sad, mad, and I was satisfied with that. Um, really not presuming confidence, honestly, in all of my students at that point. Um, right about that, the time that we were looking um, closely at our practices and realizing the importance of social emotional language development, um, we were at the beginning of the pandemic and the state of Virginia um, wisely, um, identified this as a need for all students in the state of Virginia and, and everywhere, I'm sure. Um, and they decided to look into a program and they identified speech pathologists as being the professionals they wanted to reach out to. So they found this program called um, Komochis and Komochis is the Japanese word for feelings. 
So, um, and I apologize if you hear my clock in the background. It's funny the things that you don't realize <laughs> are background noise in your house until you're doing this. Um, Komotis are these little um, stuffed um, figures that you see in, on the left, um, which kids are really, really motivated for. It's a very organized program for introducing lots of vocabulary words for feelings. And we um, put this into every single session that we do. And our teachers have um, followed up with this and they put it into their, what we call morning meeting and throughout the day. Um, Kamochis had, there's a cost for these materials, but they have lots and lots of free resources, including visuals that are used within our program. Um, so you can access that. And there's a resource um, for this in um, on our handout. So this has been really, really a good, um, a good addition to what we're doing. And then we also use the zones of regulation, if you're familiar with that, which really just um, helps the student become more aware internally whether they're ready for learning, whether they're in that green zone, which means they're calm, they're feeling okay, and they're focused. Um, so we, we insert that into our um, group lessons every week as well. And I have a little poster at the top because this is the tweak that we made for both of these programs. Um, and that little poster says, believe. What we found that we were doing is that we really weren't believing our students. We, we were telling them how they felt based on their outward behavior. Um, which zone they were in based on their outward behavior. And we would hear things like um, if you ask someone and they said they were mad, uh, we would hear things like, you're not mad. You don't look mad. And if you think about it, um, if I'm mad, I don't always show that on the outside. So we need to extend that same respect to our students. And this has been part of our communication partner training also. Um, both for our parents and for our staff to make sure we reframe all of these and make sure that we're asking them and we're believing what they say. And this is part of self-advocacy that they learn that they're going to be believed um, and that that's been a huge benefit for us. And the result of this, the result of this um, has been interesting to me. I've been doing this for the last three years. And for most of the year, I'll say that I get, when I ask them how they're feeling, we get happy, sad, mad. They kind of stick to that restrictive vocabulary. But towards the end of the year, every year, I start to hear different things. I feel brave, I feel hurt, I feel silly. Um, and this is a huge deal to me. Um, we have recently gotten into looking more at trauma-informed treatment. Um, unfortunately, all of us are having to think about that with um, the students that we have, um, having been through the, the pandemic um, in particular. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is that someone's mental health is improved when they're able to um, accurately express their feelings and accurately tell their story. So we're certainly in hopes that this is helping them um, and improving their mental health as well. All right, so go back, revisit the case study and you can put down some ideas there or in the chat. Um, what do we need to consider for him in order to provide access to social emotional vocabulary? What, what are the important takeaways um, for that? I'll let you all do that. And then just a reminder um, what all of our pieces are um, for this puzzle that we've hopefully put together for our practices. Um, and I'll give you a second and then I have a recap of our case study that we'll go through. Are there any thoughts in the chat about our case study? There. 
Yeah, videos of different feelings. So it's active paired with modeling on their device. Absolutely. Um, because that's, of course, the challenge of teaching emotions. Um, the fact that um, it's very abstract to look at faces, for example, which might be a more traditional way to do this. Um, and certainly modeling, and I like somebody said, model, 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 um, modeling in the moment for them and having these visuals available so that you actually model when they're, when they're displaying these emotions for sure, definitely. All right, so I'm gonna go back and let me go back and see. Yes, teaching. Yeah, the thought of teaching them to argue and negotiate, yes. Yes, okay, good. Um, all right, so I'm gonna revisit our um, case study and just let you know, um, and we're hoping with the Canva that we might be able to email it if anybody would like, we'll kind of put it together um, so that we have those ideas. Um, we'll kind of explore that when we're done. But I wanted to let you know the outcome so far for this young man. And remember that he was, um, he's seven years old and he's just entering our program and um, a structured educational situation. Prior to that, he was at home where he got to basically go around and do what he wanted, of course. Um, so under access to robust communication system, um, we are actively working on um, developing a multimodal AAC system. He, right when he came to us, he was approved for um, a high-tech device. So he does have a device. Um, we're using also a backup system, which is a modified version of picture exchange. Um, and of course his gestures and part of my communication partner training is making sure everyone accepts all of his gestures. Um, and also considering the fact that he is really an emergent communicator. And this is something that I, ha I have had to really stress with communication partners. Um, because they assume if someone has a device, they must be able to just suddenly use it effectively. And we all know that that's not the case. And then um, the other important component here is that we include him in literacy instruction. Um, that's extremely important as we've, um, we have many, many examples of um, successes um, because we include everyone in, in good literacy instruction. So making sure that that's happening in the classroom is really important. Can you say a little bit about why you think that's important? I mean, what does literacy instruction um, contribute to for him um, in, in this current state of crying all the time? Um, what, what we feel, um, we are in the business, and you all know this, of thinking I'm sorry, of I've now. called you Heather twice. You are Melanie. Oh, I know that's that. okay, I'm Melanie. <laughs> but when we answer to, to both. Um, <laughs> we are in the business of thinking about now and the future and developing the, his multimodal system for the future. We want to develop that robust communication system. So making sure that he's not left out of literacy instruction in spite of um, what may, going, may be going on right now, we wanna make sure that we start now exposing him to letters and phonological awareness and all of those things that will set him up later for being able to, um, to add that and make his, his communication system a robust system. And we are working on ways to do that um, by connecting students personally to literacy materials. So um, that's one of the things that we're hoping to do. When we do something that's motivating for him, that we include literacy, in that we include printed words and we include letters and things like that as much as possible. So that we're, we're laying the groundwork for setting up this robust communication system. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. I think. Yeah. 
Um, under student choices and opinions, I think this is a big issue for him. Um, he has gone from seven years of being able to do exactly what he wanted. And um, his father, what his father said is that he basically would go around to the swing and the couch and different places in the room and use YouTube all day long. Um, so he had really complete control. And then he came into a setting where he felt he had no control in this setting. So to, we needed to help him feel more in control of what was happening. Um, because he's obviously with his crying, he's telling us, oh my goodness, <laughs> this, this, is, this is awful. And I don't know how long this is going to last. This torture is going to last. So by doing um, frequent reinforcer assessments, a lot of what I do is trying to find like things that he really likes. And then um, using a first then visual with him right now and getting him used to that so that first he has to do something structured, but we're gonna make it very successful for him so that he can get to the then, which is his reinforcing activity he wants to do and getting used to doing that so that he knows he does have some control. And then that modeling, and I actually have just recently started using the term narrating with communication partners. Um, I've been um, frustrated with the fact that I've used the term modeling. That's kind of a foreign word to use for what we do. Um, and I would still get the hand over hand um, prompting of kids to say what they wanted them to say, or the say this, use your talker to say this. Um, and we wanted to get away from that. So I've just started using the term narrating so that they get the idea that they are narrating with plenty of time for a student to get in there. So um, modeling and narrating and showing them, showing him, building his vocabulary so that he can make those choices and let himself be known. So working on that um, vocabulary for highly reinforcing things that he has. And oh, I see we're almost, almost out of time. Communication partner training, I'll do this really quickly. Obviously let him negotiate um, develop and then argue also develop more understanding for his loss of control in his environment. So teaching communication partner um, why he might be crying all the time, giving him, him, helping them have more empathy for him, that modeling or narrating, and then helping them understand that he's an emerging um, communicator and he is partner assisted right now. I consider him to be partner assisted. So teaching them all about that. And then encouraging under a uh, connection to role models, encouraging that partner play with him when it becomes appropriate right now, it's a little difficult with him, but encouraging that, looking for that opportunity when we're gonna make that happen. And then sharing resources, of course, with family and staff for those role models so that, um, so that they see the possibilities for their child. And then under social emotional language development, going ahead and using that vocabulary for feelings now um, before I probably would have um, prioritized um, names of things that he liked, for example, but understanding that that using that vocabulary for feelings now is really important and include him in the routine of asking about his feelings and then that modeling or narrating. Um, for that vocabulary is important. So I'll tell you really quickly, I have one more minute um, to tell you about the outcome of all of these things that we've put in place so far. Um, and this is um, from this last week. Um, he's been described by his paraprofessionals um, and classroom teacher as having better days. So they feel better about what's going on. And then I have this note to myself, he doesn't like my ducks. Um, and, and this is a really good story, I think, about him and how far he's come. They've been using the first then very consistently over the last, I would say, two to three weeks. Um, and we've been developing a list of things that he really likes. And one of the things that I do when I go in to see him is I, I go into the classroom, first of all. Um, we push in. 
for everything. And I take in what I think is my most exciting thing. And this past week I took in, um, I took in water and a tub and some ducks and a squirt gun or a, a spray bottle, I should say. Um, and I just thought this was going to be fantastic. And he tolerated me for just a little bit. And then he actually reached around. His paraprofessional was there because I was doing some communication partner training with her. Um, his paraprofessional um, had put his schedule off to the side and it was kind of in disarray, actually. He reached around, he grabbed um, something from his schedule, went into his book because um, he had his, his picture exchange book um, that day and not his device. Um, he pulled out YouTube and on the front of it, because he didn't have his first then schedule right in front of him, he put social studies, um, YouTube. So he was telling me that he did not like my activity, that he wanted to get back to doing what the rest of the class was doing. And the one thing that I um, talked to the, the paraprofessional about, it might be easy to think that I wanted compliance. I wanted him to play with those ducks. And I coached her and said, no, 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 let's, this is great. This is great. We're going to hear him and we're going to let him do what he wanted to do. So that is our, um, that was the outcome. And I'm looking forward to better days with him. So that, that's that a remarkable it. success story. And in the chat, Michael says, I love that you spend time with students to better express their feelings and more frequently. So, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a great ending comment for our session today. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate this opportunity. Like I said, we've been very passionate about this and the, the changes that we have seen. Um, we're a little over time. We're gonna go ahead and stop the recording, but we always leave um, uh, just a, the opportunity here to um, invite people to ask other questions, have any com conversations with uh, 